Thank you all for joining us today for our monthly speaker series. Um, this month, we get to uh, have a presentation or a guest speaker is Anna Zyberts from Disability Rights Washington. She is the director of the Disability Mobility Initiative uh, Project. Um, just as a quick background on SnowTrack, SnowTrack, the Snohomish County Transportation Coalition advocates for connecting people and communities in Snohomish County and beyond with safe, equitable, and accessible transportation. Our current priorities are creating coordinating mobility services across the county, educating outreach and engagement on our work, planning and design of livable communities, uh, securing and pub uh, public support and funding uh, for uh, greater mobility options, and finally, um, helping coordinate our, the conversations happening about, around emergency response, especially as it relates to transportation. Uh, we've had a, a great uh, speaker series uh, this past year. We started it this year. Um, our first speaker was Don Ho Chang, uh, then of SDOT, Seattle Department of Transportation, to talk to us about um, how to make our streets safer. And uh, just this past week, uh, he took on a new role with the Washington State Department of Transportation as the state's chief traffic engineer. Um, so I have a warning to Anna that, you know, perhaps there might be a new job in your future as a result of the speaker series. Um, I am really excited to have her uh, present about her, her work and her, her organization that they're doing um, here in Washington State. Uh, it, she, she produces some of the best videos, for example, as part of her advocacy, and I, she's not going to show them here today is what I hear, um, but just the, the way she is able to connect the stories of people's daily lives uh, to policy action is just truly inspiring. Um, and I'm not going to hold back and, and letting her speak, so I'm going to kick it over to her uh, right away. So with that, um, feel free to share your screen as soon as I stop sharing my screen. Awesome. Thanks, Rock, and hi, everyone. I'm going to paste a few links in the chat before I get going and make my screen uh, full screen. So these are some things I'm going to just uh, refer to, and you can click on them as you want to. All right. There we go. Let me go ahead and start screen sharing. So awesome to have such an awesome group of folks gathered here today. I am, yeah, I'm really excited to, to be able to talk about our work and um, what we're going to be doing soon. All right, let's see. I am struggling a little bit here with, uh, where did we go? Hang on, sorry. Somehow we close, let me just, uh, there we go. That present. All right. Rolling. So again, yeah, my name is Anna Zivartz. Um, she, her pronouns, or she, they. And I um, do have a lot of awesome videos, but in my experience with presenting <laughs> via Zoom, a lot of times the audio and the video playback can get just really messed up. And so I'm gonna encourage you all on your own time to check out some of those videos. You can see them, you can follow them uh, on, on our social media, on TikTok, on uh, Twitter, on Instagram. Um, you can also view them on YouTube as well, and I'll paste the link for that. Um, but I, I encourage you to, to try it on TikTok. I know it's a bit of a, a new platform for a lot of us, but I, I, we just started posting stuff there in the last couple of weeks, and it's just been incredible, the feedback we've received so far. Um, so uh, that I'll go ahead and get going. So the Disability Mobility Initiative is a program of Disability Rights Washington. And I know I've, I've uh, interacted with some of you and I really support, uh, appreciate all the support we've received in the last year since we started talking about launching this program. Disability Rights Washington is a statewide advocacy uh, organization for people with disabilities. And you know, overwhelmingly we hear in the feedback we get from our community that we represent that transportation access is a, is a need and should be a priority. And so last, uh, last summer, we started talking about launching the Disability Mobility Initiative as a new program within Disability Rights Washington that would talk about how to improve access uh, for people with disabilities throughout the state uh, to our communities um, 
and what kinds of transportation and mobility and sidewalk and infrastructure changes we would need to, to have that access. And as we started to have those conversations, we realized that while there are many people with disabilities who can and do drive, where we saw the areas of greatest need and where we saw the most overlap with communities of color, uh, immigrant communities, indigenous communities, core communities was uh, with, with folks who can't drive. And so that's been sort of the, the, the push of our advocacy. The focus of our advocacy is for non-drivers throughout the state. So this is our, our mission. Uh, we believe that every community should have reliable and accessible transit and infrastructure and the infrastructure we need to roll and walk on our streets and that every one of us should be able to move in our communities without fear of harassment or police violence. Um, just a quick background on who I am. Uh, I actually grew up in Washington. I grew up in Olympia, um, outside of Olympia. And I have been low vision my entire life. I have a genetic condition um, that prevents me from getting a driver's license. And as a teenager, I tried to, to fight that. And I tried to get a friend to teach me how to drive in a parking lot at Evergreen State College. And I promptly ran her mother's pickup truck um, up a tree. And so that was the end of my, <laughs> my desire to ever get behind the wheel of a car. Uh, and so now um, after living on the East Coast for um, my early adulthood, I moved back to Washington State about four years ago. And I live in Seattle now. Uh, and this is a picture of me and my son. He also has the same eye condition I do. And so, you know, I'm fighting for myself here, but I'm also fighting for uh, future generations of folks from throughout our state who want to have livable, rollable, uh, accessible communities. And so um, that's who I am. So as I mentioned, yeah, Disability Rights Washington, we, we hear again and again, access to transportation is a priority for, uh, for the people we talk to um, who identify as disabled. Uh, and we know that when we just look at the data and the data is pretty limited, but we know that nearly a quarter of our state population doesn't have a driver's license. And that includes young people and that includes old people, that includes disabled people, and that includes people who can't afford a vehicle. Um, and it's, it's actually probably, you know, there's probably more than, I mean, the, the data we have is based on looking at the number of driver's licenses that the, the DLL issue is divided by the state population. We wish we had more specific data than that, but unfortunately it's not something that really gets asked in the census or the American Community Survey. Um, we, yeah, we, we wish that it, that it would be. Um, they do ask how many cars per household, but that doesn't, look at what happens within that household. For example, who within that household has access to cars, can drive, who has to be driven. Uh, and even if you have you know, a car within your household and, and, and you could theoretically ask someone to drive you, what we hear you know, again and again um, with interviews with people from across our state is that that burden of asking prevents people from doing a lot of things that they, they would love to be able to do. So, uh, I also talked a little bit about, you know, how those of us who can't drive are disproportionately um, disabled, BIPOC, Indigenous, and immigrants. Um, and, you know, not only are more, we, you know, folks who are disabled and, um, and uh, from communities of color, from immigrant communities, from Indigenous communities, more likely to be non-drivers, we're also more likely to be injured or killed in crashes. And that's um, both because of the, the infrastructure in our communities um, doesn't meet our needs. For example, there's not safe crossings, there's not accessible curb ramps, um, there's not you know, crossings that are next to the bus stop and you know, so we end up having to cross in unsafe ways. Um, there are no sidewalks um, in many places. Uh, so the infrastructure doesn't meet our needs. And then we're also more likely to, to live in communities that are further out and away from the investments that have happened in infrastructure, right? or in, away from the most reliable transit service because we're more likely to be poor. And so um, sort of a double, a double whammy there and why we think this work is, is so important. And so um, at Disability Rights Washington uh, Disability Mobility Initiative, uh, our model of change is really an organizing model of change. We believe in, in bringing people together in, uh, in collecting the stories of people who, who can't drive throughout our state, amplifying those stories, connecting us to each other, and then using those stories and, uh, and, and motivating people to become advocates for themselves uh, in the world that, that we hope that we can create that's 
accessible to all of us. Oh no, my battery and my light is dying here. So hopefully it, it hangs on. Uh, so um, the big project that we started last fall was our disability mobility transportation access uh, story map. And this is just a screenshot of the story map. You can see it at mobilizewa.org. Uh, we have interviewed so far over 125 Washingtonians who can't or don't drive. Um, and um, this is an example of, of what that looks like. Um, there's the, the, the story maps available in a couple of different formats. Uh, the format um, here is, is, a, is a story map uh, format created by Knight Labs, but you can also download it as a Word document, as a PDF, as a text document, and have the stories sorted by legislative districts. So you can see the folks from your community um, who, who can't drive and their access and mobility needs. And in these stories, you know, we did an interview with everyone. We asked them to share a photo. Uh, we included a short summary of their story and then also a couple of quotations directly from them. So you hear in their own words uh, what their, their mobility needs are. And again, this is another map of the geographic distribution of our story map. Uh, interviews and you know we've gotten we've gotten folks from every single legislative district, which was our goal. Um, but we want to continue to do interviews and uh, collect stories so that we really do have representation from every community uh, throughout our state. And then you know what are we doing with this beyond it just sort of existing as a story map? Um, the first thing we did is that we invited folks who had participated to let their voices be heard in the state legislature last year. And so this is a, a photo of Crystal Monteros, who's from Tacoma, uh, testifying in the, let's see, this looks like the Senate <laughs> uh, last year around transportation funding, asking for more funding for sidewalks, more funding for reliable transit. Uh, we also have been holding a number of press conferences. This is one we held in, in Vancouver, Washington. This is right on the border of, of Clark County in Vancouver, where there's no sidewalk at this bus stop. And so um, this is Chris who lives in the area there. And she, this is, you know, this, this intersection she has to cross, they're one-way streets. Um, there's no accessible pedestrian signals. And so because they're one-way streets, there's big gaps in traffic often, and it's difficult for her to listen to just the traffic noise to cross safely. So it's, it's a really scary intersection for her. Um, and then she gets across and has to, to navigate this stretch of muddy um, ditch basically uh, down um, down the side of the road to the bus stop. Uh, and, and so much of our state is like this. There are transit stops throughout our state that aren't accessible, um, that are really difficult to get to. We've also encouraged folks who participated in our story map to, to let their voices be heard in the media. And so this is a map of uh, you know, some of the places that, that op-eds and letters to the editors that our folks uh, wrote, got published. And so you can read more of those stories on the story map as well. And these are, these are some photos of people who participated uh, um, and, and participated in our advocacy from different parts of the state. So I'm going to take a few minutes now to, to talk through some of those stories. We also, since, um, since we've been able to be out in the world a little more and filming more often, uh, we have started uh, to do more video interviews and um, be out in the neighborhoods with people filming their situations and their transit and their sidewalks. And so um, I encourage you to check out those videos on social media because uh, it really does, uh, you know, illustrate what's going on. But for now, I'm going to sort of just walk you through some of the stories and then you can find these on our social media channels. So this is Crystal Montero. She lives in, in Tacoma and uh, right on the border of Tacoma and Lakewood. And we see this a lot, right, where, you know, the more dense urban areas have become more expensive and the affordable housing is sort of at the outskirts of a city, right, where it reaches the county line. And so um, on the left side is Crystal's uh, apartment complex, which is, which is in the city of Tacoma. And this side of the street is Lakewood. And um, this is the bus stop, the Pierce Transit bus stop she uses, and it's not paved and there's no sidewalk. Um, and this is a really busy for four lane arterial street here that you would never ever want to roll along or walk along. So, you know, you, you basically have to be in the mud and the sand. And we've been having conversations with the city of Tacoma and Lakewood um, and University Place. There's like three jurisdictions that all kind of meet right here to see what we can do because these are all low income apartment complexes around this area. Many, many transit dependent folks. Um, and Crystal is just one of those people there that would benefit tremendously from having sidewalks 
um, throughout this area. This is Cody, uh, Cody Shane. He lives in Chihuahua, Washington, which is about an hour north of Spokane. Uh, you may have heard about the highway widening project or the highway construction project in Spokane, um, the north-south corridor. Um, if you keep on going north along that highway, that's, that's where Chihuahua is. And so this is a state highway. It's the main road through Chihuahua. And uh, Cody Shane can't drive, uh, but he does ride this, his bike, which is a, a tricycle around his community. And to, to cross the main street in Chihuahua, um, is a real challenge. There's only one light for the whole town and the town is pretty big. I would say it stretches a mile to two miles um, along, along this highway. And so you either have to dash across the state highway, which is slated to get even more traffic, or you have to go to this light. Um, and that's, that's where he's crossing right now. Uh, and you can see that the sidewalks or the, the crosswalks here are, are completely faded. Um, after we shared some of these photos, WashDOT the next week got out there and painted them. So that was exciting. But, uh, you know, there, there are so many places like this across the state where the needs of pedestrians, the needs of people who are walking and rolling just aren't, you know, aren't, aren't getting the attention they deserve. This is Tanisha. Um, Tanisha lives in West Seattle. Um, and again, so she is another person who would prefer to live somewhere closer in, um, closer to better transit, closer to, to sidewalks, but, uh, because of housing affordability, she's sort of been, you know, displaced out to the outskirts of, of, of West Seattle, um, the Delridge area. And so this is Holden Street, for those of you who know the area, Holden Street has become a major detour route um, with the West Seattle Bridge closure. And so there's a lot of traffic um, that goes along this road here. And unfortunately, the road is also missing curb ramps. And so for Tanisha to get from her apartment complex down to the nearest bus stop, she has to roll on the street. And uh, we went out there and filmed her. And this is my colleague, Kimberly, standing behind her because we were actually like, both Kimberly and I were like, we're, we're freaked out about getting in the street and, and filming with her. We thought for sure we'd be hit. It was a, a really, yeah, terrifying experience. And the other part that <laughs> makes it even more terrifying is that traffic gets backed up here along Holden Street. And so cars will actually, you know, use where she is, even though it's not a lane, they'll use it as a lane to sort of try to cut ahead. And often will actually cut up into the grass, into the, you know, right up over the curb. And so the whole time we're, we're rolling along here, we could see tire tracks and you can see a little bit of tire tracks there. There's not too many in this, this particular photo in the grass um, to her right. And so, you know, it, it, again, an example of what happens when we are prioritizing modes um, other than people being able to, to walk and roll. Uh, and so we are, we are working with Tanisha to see if we can get those curb ramps built um, because it's really not a safe solution for her to be rolling down the side of the street uh, to get to her bus stop. This is Sarah Beth. Uh, Sarah Beth lives in Bellingham uh, and she has some young kids and is a paratransit user. And she realized after um, she started to try to use Paris Transit with her youngest kid that the paratransit vehicles actually couldn't accommodate a car seat. Um, there was no way for her to secure a car seat into the paratransit vehicles. And so she ended up having to, to stop using paratransit because it just, it didn't work for her. And, you know, one of the things that, that I think doesn't get a lot of attention is disabled people who are parents, disabled people who are caregivers. We often think of disabled people as children or as people who are, you know, the recipients of care. But that, you know, while that is sometimes true, disabled people are also parents and caregivers themselves. And so we have to start designing transportation systems that can, can accommodate our needs as parents and caregivers. And this is a really, a, a, you know, a powerful example of a system that just doesn't work for parents. This is another parent here, Nancy. Um, she lives close to, to Aberdeen, Grace Harbor. And uh, she has a couple of now adult kids uh, with disabilities, she's also blind. And so they use paratransit and she struggled with paratransit because you know, the, the service only allows her to bring one child with her. 
And so sometimes she would have a child that she couldn't leave um, at home, whether that's an adult child or a young child. And so um, she would struggle with that because she wouldn't have care for the child unless she brought them with her, but the paratransit would only allow her to bring one child. And so just an example of another rule that makes it difficult <laughs> for parents and caregivers to access, uh, access transportation. Nancy also had some really wonderful things to share about how she lives in an area that's, you know, on the outskirts of Aberdeen and Grays Harbor. And as funding for paratransit and transit kept on getting cut and cut, she actually used to use fixed route transit, um, but the schedules for that got cut and cut and finally it got cut entirely. And so she switched to using paratransit. And now the, 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 tra the area that transit serves in her county has also shrunk. And so she isn't, she's just barely on the border of what is um, considered an area that can be served by paratransit. And they kind of had to be like, well, as the crow flies, it's two miles. And so, you know, from the nearest transit stop. And so they kept her in, in the system, but she's really concerned that future cuts um, any further cuts to, to transit service in that area would mean that she would be outside of that service um, and would lose all access to mobility. And I was, I was just talking to her yesterday because I'm going to go out and try to film her next week. But, you know, she's like, before I used to rely a lot on friends and family and that's great, but she's 80 now and a lot of her friends are also in their 70s and 80s and she's like, they're not able to drive anymore. Or if they do drive, she's afraid to ride with them because they probably shouldn't be driving. And so, you know, we have the situation where there's a lot of folks who are living in more rural areas who are aging out of driving, right? And how, how do we create a transit system that's gonna work for them? On the other age of the <laughs> spectrum of the age, other, other end of the age spectrum, um, we have Lily here who lives in Federal Way. And this story, this story I think just for me is, is, is the one that, uh, epitomizes what is wrong with our system. So Lily lives in King County, um, but she lives and she lives in the, the dot there. There's a little, little arrow. Um, she lives really close to Tacoma. And so she, you know, all her friends are in Tacoma, all her, all her doctor's appointments, all everything she needs to do is in Tacoma. But because she's in King County, um, to get to Tacoma using paratransit, she has to request paratransit uh, you know, two days in advance instead of just 24 hours because she's cross county. And so that makes it really, really challenging for her to get out and do the things she wants to do. And she would love to use fixed route transit, but there's no sidewalk uh, on the street she lives on. And so she can't get safely from her house to the nearest bus stop. And so she's stuck using the system that really doesn't work for her. And, you know, I think as a young person, it, 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 it just, I don't know, it got, it got me that she's not able to go hang out with her friends. She's not able to engage in, in the social activities she wants to engage in because of this lack of sidewalk in a system that just doesn't work. And she described for me how it, that has really been difficult for her mental health um, because she's also someone who became disabled. And so, you know, that, that change in her mobility has been, um, and then the loss of social activity has really been difficult. And I, you know, it just, it, it doesn't have to be that way. Like, why can't, why can't we just build that sidewalk? And I know it's expensive, but it's, you know, it's about priorities and what, what our state values. This is a photo I, I went out to Bremerton to film uh, JR and Kat. Um, they live in Bremerton and we went to visit a friend of theirs who's also blind and a non-driver. And after we um, caught the bus to our house, we were waiting for the bus on the way back. And uh, we had to wait in this road. Um, you can see it's a two lane road. Um, there's a bus stop here, but there's no sidewalk and it's just, it's loose gravel. And uh, Kat's in a, in a wheelchair. And so she can't go into that loose gravel. Um, she gets stuck. And so we, we sat on this road and the bus runs every hour. So we, you know, we timed it. <laughs> so we didn't have to sit in the middle of the road too long. Um, we sat on the road and the bus driver showed up and uh, he pulled up in front of us and tried to put his ramp into the gravel and Kat's like, I can't get in there. I, I can't, I'll get stuck. Uh, and he's like, well, I don't know what to do. And I was like, can you back up? And the bus driver says, well, we can't, we're not allowed to back up. And I was like, oh yeah, we're not allowed to back up. I didn't know that. So 
because we thought we could go back to that corner um, that's behind them and get on. And so finally, he agreed to block traffic on the road both ways um, so that he could extend the rat ramp um, so Kat could get on. Because if we didn't catch that bus, you know, we'd have to wait for him to come around. It was going to be another hour uh, for us to wait. And so it's just, you know, another example of infrastructure that is um, that is lacking. And it doesn't have to be that way. And, you know, JR and Kat and their friend Debbie, who we were visiting, a lot of them, they, they do use paratransit because of gaps like this in the infrastructure. And, you know, Debbie, who we were visiting, describes how there used to be a bus stop closer to her house, which was awesome. Now there's not, now that she has to use paratransit, she can't just get out and, you know, go get milk when she's out of milk or bread when she's out of bread. And uh, she really has to think and plan and, you know, all that spontaneity she had um, is gone. All right. I'm, I'm, <laughs> this is, uh, this is Mitchell here. Uh, Mitchell lives in Lacey. Uh, and he, you know, he's a wheelchair user and he talked to me so much about sidewalks. Um, the sidewalks around Lacey are, are narrow and old. A lot of the curb ramps are angled out into the streets. And so when he's navigating, he'll have to sort of turn out into what is, you know, 40 to 50 mile an hour traffic on some of these arterials um, to get, you know, through it, through an intersection. Um, and, and it was terrifying. I, it was, again, it was one of those moments when I was filming with him, where I was like, wow, this is, <laughs> I really hope no one gets hurt while we're filming this. Um, he also, a lot of the, the, the roads in Lacey, the sidewalks are, there's no, um, there's no planting strip. And so the sidewalk is right adjacent to the road and there's no shoulder. And so the cars are right next to you. Um, going, you know, 40 or 50 miles an hour. And so for, for Mitchell, that's the, having these big cracks and bumps is super scary because if his chair were to tilt or lean um, or, you know, end up anywhere near that traffic, he'd get hit. Um, and that's, that's a big risk as these, you know, there's all these big cracks and heaves and, um, and that's frustrating. I think for him, he's lived other places in the country. He's lived down in California, and he, you know, comparatively, he thinks the sidewalks here in Washington are are much worse. And that's that's a real struggle. Um, on the right here, I have a photo of Inner City Transit. Though one thing he he was excited about was that Inner City Transit has gone fare free, and you can see there's a lot more room um, as he's getting on the bus um, to not have to sort of navigate, you know, with the fare box and try to. Um, get, you know, his fare paid. Um, for him, he's had a couple of, of confrontations both here and in other jurisdictions with, um, with police who have been called when he wasn't able to produce the right fare card. And so he is a huge supporter of, of moving towards a transit system that, you know, has, the, with, with a fare isn't a barrier for folks who can't pay. Um, and also isn't a barrier for folks like him who, you know, getting out and, and producing, showing, showing his fair pass um, was never an easy thing. And so it created delays, created tension, created stress. And so he's, he's, a, he's one of the people we talked to who was really excited about um, that move to move away from fares. In, a, in another community, this is Clayton. Uh, he uh, is up in the San Juans in Friday Harbor. And, you know, the San Juans, there's not, <laughs> they're small, they're small communities. Um, and he loves living up there because, because it is small and everyone knows him. Um, and Clayton loves the theater and he's 32. He lives with his parents still, but he loves to be able to go out and, and go, to, go to shows in Friday Harbor. Uh, and they live pretty close to town, but there's no sidewalk. And so he has a, you know, motorized scooter, but he can't get there using the scooter because there's no sidewalks. I think it's something that's going to get built soon. So he's pretty excited about that. The other challenge he has and other, you know, other folks on the island have is that there's no, uh, there's no wheelchair accessible taxi or, or transit service of any kind. And so if he wants to go somewhere, it's got to be with his parents. It's got to be with someone who's either comfortable you know, it either has to be, you know, they have to be able to com comfortable lifting him and lifting his wheelchair um, in and out of a vehicle. And there's no, there's no way, there's no Uber, there's no Lyft, there's no taxi that will do that. 
And so he he's completely dependent on friends and family to provide that for him. And that um, that's hard for him. He he feels like he gives up a lot because he's not willing to ask his his parents to wake up, you know, after they've gone to sleep to come pick him up at eleven o'clock at night when the theater show's over, um, or even just getting to and from work. Um, it's a struggle to always be asking rides. And so uh, he's he and a bunch of other there's a there's a group of young adults who are wheelchair users um, who live in Friday Harbor who are all pushing really hard to get the senior center. Um, and, and whatever other funding they can get to get a wheelchair accessible van or shuttle of some kind that can be used to provide transportation um, for them. Uh, so they have a bit more freedom, a bit more independence, a bit more mobility. And I really, really hope, you know, that that can be possible because as someone who, you know, grew up in Olympia and grew up um, outside of transit service, having to ask your parents to drive you everywhere as a young adult or as an adult is it's um it's infantilizing and i think too many people in our state who aren't able to afford to or don't have the supports to live in big cities um with with reliable transit networks it just you know that is that is our reality this is jamin uh, he lives in Port Orchard, Washington, and he is a he's a paratransit user primarily, um, though he also uses fixed route transit um, and, you know, likes to get around on his his scooter. He um, he had an incident recently where he was riding his scooter along the main road in in uh, in Port Orchard, which also happens to be a state highway. And there's sidewalks along parts of it, but they're um, the curb ramps aren't ADA compliant. And there was one that was kind of just like this old, I wouldn't even call it a ramp. Basically the sidewalk had sort of disintegrated and so it was kind of a ramp and he was going down it and he flipped out into the state road um, right as a bus was coming and uh, nearly got hit. And so he is, he's a big advocate for fixing that sidewalk, fixing the curd ramps, getting those ramps built so that you know people can get to the bus stops, can get where they need to go um, without getting stuck and without getting stuck in these really dangerous situations. So uh, <laughs> at the end of the, the stories I'm going to share with you, but I do encourage you, a lot of these have become videos. They're on our social media. Um, you can go there and check them out. We, uh, the next steps is we're, you know, continuing to build our story map. We have a bunch of interns working with us this summer to interview additional folks, and we're going to continue to add stories and, and connect with more people. We also realize that there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of expertise that's been, um, you know, shared with us, and and we felt like, well, here's a wonderful opportunity to sort of institutionalize that more by turning what we have into a white paper. And so my colleague Kimberly has been working on that for the last couple of months, and we're we're getting ready to release it, which is very exciting next Wednesday. Um, and you're welcome to join us. We have a press conference release party um, on Zoom next Wednesday at 10 a.m. And one of those links I shared was, was that. Uh, and so what we did is we took all these interviews and we sort of read through them and pulled out common themes and organized them into sections and um, made then a bunch of recommendations and recommendations that go to elected leaders, that go to transit agencies, that go to transportation um, providers, uh, transportation departments, um, other, other transit providers. And so um, this here on the screen right now is a list of the different categories. We have sidewalks, curb cuts, curb cuts and intersections, transit frequency connections and schedules, transit wayfinding equipment and shelters, specialized transportation services, rod host services and taxis, uh, transit driver training, fare enforcement, the needs of parents and caregivers, leveraging technology, crisis response and resilience, a tough trade-off, housing affordability and transportation access, access to employment, independence, community and well-being, deterred demand and inclusive transportation planning. So a lot of different uh, thoughts, a lot of different recommendations, a lot of analysis, and we're really excited to have this out there in the world. I think we see a lot of uh, transportation research about people with disabilities that doesn't actually include people with disabilities uh, in that research. You know, it's, it's interviews with transit providers, it's interviews um, uh, with planners. And, and so we're really excited to start to bring the, the voices of people with disabilities directly into that planning uh, conversation. So please join us next, next Wednesday. Uh, we'd love to have you um, 
yeah, learn more about what we've learned um, from our research so far. And if you're not able to join us next Wednesday and you'd like to get a copy of the white paper, you can um, always email me. I will put my email in the chat, but you can also sign up to our email list. Um, if you go to Mobilize WA, and then there's a, a link to sign up to our to the email list for, for the Disability Mobility Initiative. So uh, that's a good way to sort of follow our work if you're not uh, all up and, and TikTok and the other social media channels. The other thing we're going to be launching uh, next week um, with our, our um, white paper is a week without driving challenge. <laughs> uh, and I'm excited about this. I think it'll be it'll be interesting. So uh, we are inviting elected leaders um, and other, other uh, leaders of transportation departments and transit agencies to pledge to try to spend a week without driving themselves. Um, we're gonna say October 1st through 8th um, are the, the official dates, but if folks need to do it another week, you know, we're flexible. And so uh, th this is live on our website now, but we'll start to, start to publicize it next week. And we're gonna be putting this invite out and encouraging in particular members of the legislature, um, but also other elected leaders. Um, if they wanna join us and do this, um, there's, there'll be a short exit interview when they finish. You can either send us some, some responses to questions reflecting on your experience or uh, you know, share with us over the phone or over a Zoom call. Uh, and then and it, it'll be a way for us to start to you know, have more folks understand what are the barriers and challenges to getting around our state um, without a car. Oops. And uh, yeah, this was a press conference with uh, with uh, Governor Inslee last week that we were at, and and talking to him, I think you know what we're really trying to emphasize here is that what we're asking for, you know, it, it's about access for people who can't drive. Uh, that's you know the heart of what we're doing, but it's also bigger than that. It's about public health. We know uh, how auto dependence and and the pollution from that and the crashes disproportionately impact communities of color, low-income communities, travel communities throughout our state. Uh, it's also about the climate. And it's hard to, to not be thinking about that as we're you know, waiting for the smoke to arrive this summer. How can we actually begin to meaningfully reduce our carbon emissions? And we believe that you know, because transportation, because single occupancy vehicle emissions are such a huge part of that, that moving away from that model of, of, of access to our communities really is the best way to go. And so that's why we fundamentally believe that, that those of us who can't and don't drive have a lot of knowledge and expertise to bring to the table uh, and to share with others about how we can achieve a healthier and, uh, and more resilient and more climate friendly future. So I will uh, open it up for questions now. There's our, our um, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram handle, it's Dismobility. And uh, yeah, thank you all. That was fantastic, um, Anna. That, uh, those stories really bring home um, the issues that we're facing and uh, that people face. Uh, so much of, of our work is just with other planners and other agency folks. And um, that really brings it home. Uh, we have a lot of great people here in the uh, in the forum today, and I don't want to hog time with questions. Uh, I'm happy to fill in where where I think there might be gaps in questions. But if if folks want to take themselves uh, off of uh, the visual mute uh, and the audio mute and ask your question, feel free to do so. Um, you can also cue yourself by raising your hand. Um, that'd be a good way if there's a bunch of questions coming. And while folks are thinking about that, I just, there's one other link I posted in the chat here. Um, we were just on the Movement podcast. There's actually two episodes. Uh, one episode from two weeks ago that features four of our story map people. It's incredible. And then there was a follow-up episode, sort of an analysis interview that I did with them that released yesterday. And uh, they did a really lovely job editing those. Um, I, I highly encourage you to give it a listen. And so that link is uh, in the chat. Um, I, I'm really excited about your report that's coming next week. Um, I, I don't know how much you can tip your hand as to some of the, the things you're recommending in it out of all of uh, those bullet points that you had. 
Um, so um, why don't I ask a specific question? Because uh, both our Port of Everett and uh, the city of Everett have recently gone through updating their ADA transition plan, which is a federally required document for upgrading public facilities uh, for people with disabilities. Um, what in those plans, um, how can those be leveraged? Uh, how are they meaningful? How, how can they be, uh, how can we use those as tools for improving our communities? Yeah, we're so excited to finally see these ADA transition plans get updated and get published. I think um, it's our understanding that for the first time this year, I guess by October, WashDOT has required those as part of their, you know, if you're going to receive anything from the state as far as WashDOT funding. And so what, you know, I, it, it's, it's sad that it's taken us 31 years to get there. Um, but here we are, uh, we're starting to actually do that analysis. And you know, I, I think there's this, this tension between, you know, the ADA, which needs to exist and it's an important thing, but um, people thinking that this is just for disabled people, um, while it is super critical and even more critical for disabled people to have this access, the things that we're talking about there and the improvements that can come with these transition plans are things that, that are gonna benefit our communities much more broadly than just people in wheelchairs and blind people and people with mobility disabilities. Like it is, um, and and that's really what we're hoping to do with this frame is how can we, you know, talk about this in the context of how do we have a complete, you know, a sidewalks plan for our entire state. Uh, and WashDOT, you know, WashDOT moved that direction with their um, active transportation plan, but that only covers state right of ways. And we would love to see something, an analysis at the state level of, okay, let's take all these ADA, ADA transition plans that are getting submitted now to the state for the first time, compile them um, and look at what's missing and, and create a statewide map of where do we have sidewalks and what is the infrastructure there? Like, is it ADA compliant? What are the crossings like? Um, we just don't have that <laughs> and we should. I mean, it's, it's kind of absurd that we don't. And so that's something that we're asking for um, if there is gonna be a, a transportation package, a special, uh, special session this year, we would really like to see, I mean, not only the active transportation plan uh, funded, but also the beginning of taking all these ADA transition plans from different jurisdictions and putting them together to, to create a state uh, ADA transition plan. But that also looks at, okay, where do we not even have sidewalks, right? Like that's also important too. So, yeah. Great. I see Christina has her hand up. And she was responsible for the city of Everett's ADA transition plan. So awesome. Excited. So Christina, feel free to ask a question. So uh, I was hoping you could maybe give us some feedback, some guidance on what's the most important to you in prioritizing uh, the elements of our ADA transition plan. Like with you know certain amount of resources, like we have to prioritize things. And so if you have thoughts on that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, God, I mean, it's so hard, right? Because it's it's the connectivity that matters, right? And so without, with one, any piece missing, you lose the network. Um, yeah, <laughs> and so it's hard to say, okay, yeah, like this matters and this doesn't. I mean, what we really need is just more funding. And that's the our other part of the ask to the legislature is, okay, we need this statewide analysis and then we need to start putting money into a bucket that is specifically gonna address this 30 year backlog. I mean, it's longer than that, but we've known about the need to do this for 30 years and we just haven't been funding it. Um, so I don't know. I mean, you know, it's hard to say like, to you, what, what should you not fund, right? But I think, you know, thinking about networks and connectivity and if, you know, it doesn't really do a lot of good to have something if it doesn't connect to something else. Um, and so thinking about how to maximize that, that connectivity um, and I would say, you know, thinking about transit stops, thinking about community centers, thinking about grocery stores, thinking about schools, like where do people need to go? Um, and, and, you know, and where are the people who are most likely to be transit dependent um, living in your community? Um, what are those neighborhoods? Um, and, and probably they're the neighborhoods that are the most affordable um, and, and probably the neighborhoods that have been historically redlined or, you know, least invested in. Thank you, that, that's super helpful. I, I really appreciate it, so thank you. 
Yeah. Um, I was the uh, one of the bullet points on your for your white paper next week that I was really interested in was uh, the accessibility versus affordable housing uh, tension. Um, I, I assume is a little bit about thinking about the future of where people live, the tension that happens between do you how do you fund people the transportation side of making sure people get to where they need to go, or do you provide or do you build cities that are affordable so that way people can live near the things they need to get to? That was my assumption just looking at it, but I would love to for you to talk about it a little bit more about those tensions uh, or or the need for both. Um, so. Yeah. I mean, yeah, what we see from our interviews, right, is that people are already living, people who can't drive are live everywhere, right? They're not just in cities, we're not just in cities, they're all over the state. And so, um, and a lot of that, I mean, some of it's due for people, you know, cultural preferences, wanting to be close to family, near, near their support networks. Um, some of it's, a lot of it's often due to affordability and just like, frankly, you know, can't, people needing to be close to family and support networks because they can't afford not to, right? Um, and or or can't afford you know housing that that is better connected to transit. Uh, yeah, but I mean, when if people have the option, like one of the interviews we did with with Erica, um, and we just released a video with her last Friday. She's in Edmonds for all your Edmonds uh, folks, um, and she actually just moved um, down to the to the Northgate area because she and her roommates found an affordable apartment near where where the light rail is going to open, and she is so excited about that. And I think, you know, the dream for almost everyone we talked to was like, you know, I want, I want high speed rail next to my, you know, in my community, right? Like, that's the dream. Um, we know that, you know, that that isn't, you know, probably going to happen soon. Um, but that's something we can, we can think about how do we get there? How do we get more connectivity between rural areas? Um, you know, not everyone has to, if, if, like Chawila, where I was with Cody uh, Shane, it's a really like lovely, walkable, dense, old city. I mean, you know, not a city, but a town, um, you know, that is connected by a rail line to Spokane. It's not a commuter rail line, it's a, it's a freight rail. But, you know, thinking about how do we not, how do we create affordable places to live that are walkable and rollable? Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in Seattle. Um, when we can, obviously, building that, that you know, affordable housing in, in dense transit served areas is great, but it doesn't seem to ha be happening at the scale that it needs to happen. And so I really do think we have to be thinking about bringing transit and building sidewalks and accessible, you know, multi-use paths to the rest of our state. Um, yeah. Christina, do you have another question? Yeah. Yes, I, I'm Excellent. Also questions. Um, I actually hope, uh, Anna, that you can maybe address, provide tips on ways that as public agencies we can better outreach and improve our communications with people who are invested in ADA improvements to our advocates. Um, that was one thing that we really worked on, but I know we can improve. So thoughts, tips, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's so complicated, right? Because everyone, you know, anytime you do a survey, obviously the folks who are most likely to respond are the folks with the most privilege. And so like that, that's what you're going to get. <laughs> and how do you get responses from other folks? And, you know, part of that is, is being in places where other folks are making it, you know, in a language and a format that's accessible to them. And then I think a lot of it is just like, people are like, why should I bother? Like the system just doesn't serve me and it never has, and it never will. And so I'm not going to bother, you know, investing energy into, into doing this. Um, so that's tricky. <laughs> I think, you know, one thing I've noticed is that I think transportation just sort of in the context of a lot of other issues often gets written off as sort of wonky or less, less exciting to people. Uh, but I think if you talk to people who don't have access to cars or driving, it's something that we think about a lot. Like every day we're sitting on the side of the street waiting at, you know, at a bus stop or walking down where there isn't a sidewalk. Like it's something that, that there is a lot of energy that in our brain that gets spent thinking about how things could be better. And so I, I do think there's a, a great potential to tap into that um, because it, you know, I think about probably the years of my life I've spent thinking about transportation access, um, not in a paid way, right? Just because it's, it's my reality. And, and everyone who did our story map for the most part had that similar degree of passion and excitement about it. And so I, I, 
I think there's that we have to figure out how to tap into that more. Uh, but I think that takes time and I think it takes organizing and showing people, you know, bit by bit how their engagement actually does create change. And it's not just going into a black box where nothing happens. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, it's Danielle Arceo at Community Transit. And I just, um, I was inspired um, because I'm trying to bring the voice of the customer forward at our agency. And um, I do customer experience here. So I'm working on a voice of the customer for this particular customer. And if you have any tips or ideas on how I can continually bring that voice forward, I'd be happy to hear them. I like your story, so I'm, I'm taking that away. Like, I need to create stories and videos. Not quite sure how to do it. How did you connect with these folks? Yeah, it was tricky because, you know, a lot of it happened starting in November, you know, heart of the pandemic. And so we had to do it all through sort of our existing relationships and then reaching out to people we knew and seeing who they knew. Mm -hmm. um, and now that things have eased up a little bit, we have been just riding buses and talking to people. Okay. That's actually a great way to do it. Is right on. Being in a spot and just talking to who's there. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually pulled, um, I try, I'm trying to pull data on wheelchair deployments, like ramp deployments to try to see where I can intercept customers where there's a, a higher likelihood for me to find them because they're, I mean, it's, I have to find them, right? So I need to try to hone in on some spots. So that's really good. I, I'll try, I'll work on that. That's a good point to start at. Yeah. Or even just riding the buses. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Thank yeah. you. It, it takes work and it's sometimes a little uncomfortable and, you know, you are going to get, you know, you know, at least half the time ignored. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> I just did. I, you know, it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. I did interviews the other day and yeah, a lot of people didn't want to talk to me, but that's okay. Yeah. I don't give up. We also, and I actually didn't use them for this purpose because we, I don't know, we gave them all away before we were able to actually do in-person outreach, but, you know, swag, something you can exchange for their, their, you know, time, bring people in, get water bottles. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I'll just briefly add one thing during the pandemic that was helpful for snow track for two surveys was partnering with community transit to send out a text alert to the riders of a specific route because we were focused a, around certain areas uh, for a survey and that might be thinking about the tools you have already within the system uh, might be a good way for at least starting a conversation and then doing follow up and at Everett also has a text based alert system to its writers that could be used as well. Um, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, once you have people's phone numbers, I actually, I mean, I know it takes forever, but calling people like even more than texting, just it does, you know, building that relationship so they wanna call you back. Yeah, I'd love it. Yeah, yeah. good. Well, we're right at one o'clock. I wanna thank you, Anna, for a really fantastic uh, presentation, but more importantly, the, the work that you do to lift up the voices of people throughout the community, uh, throughout the state, uh, and and do the work that you do to make our communities better. So thank you, Anna, uh, inspired. And I, I'm glad to be able to work with you on other projects too, not just, just this. So uh, thank you. Yeah, um, thank you all for listening and thanks for the opportunity to, to talk about the work. It's always exciting. Great. All right. Well, we will all see you next month at a TBD speakers forum. Um, so we'll get that information out uh, relatively soon once we know all the details. So thank you, Anna, and um, everybody for coming.